Okay, welcome folks. As I said, we're going to look at enterprise architecture today, which is the foundation of design. And it helps you to put these, the different modules into context, as I said just now. Um, this, what we're going to look at is enterprise architecture, and we're going to specifically use today the Zachman enterprise architecture. Um, which is a fairly theoretical one. It's been developed by John Zachman for the, over the last 15, 20 odd years. He runs courses on it regularly. It's also paralleled by another enterprise archi architecture, which is called TOGAF, which is a, a sort of an implementation of the Zachman architecture, and it gives you the forms and other things that you need to actually implement the thing effectively. One of the reasons for looking at the Zachman Enterprise architecture is because it allows you to understand, A, how there's a hierarchy from a very, very high perspective of what an organization is trying to do, right down through six levels or so, down to the bottom level, which is the bits, the bytes, and the technology of s software design and uh, implementation, and the databases and all these other things. <coughs> but the other thing is, it asks questions. It poses lots and lots and lots of questions that you need to get answers to as you evaluate services, as you evaluate what the customers are saying that they want to have from the service, and then so on and so on and so on. To put this module slightly into context, on the way home at lunchtime, I was listening to the radio, and on it they mentioned a case that had just cut, uh, been through the court today or yesterday for a few days about Uber being uh, challenged by Transport for London in the courts as to whether or not that app sitting on a smart device constitutes or can be counted as a meter equivalent to the taxi meter because of the debate going on between the taxis, the proper taxis, the hackney carriages in London and Uber uh, because they calculate the cost of the journey based on your GPS coordinates to start and finish and where you, the route takes you to and then say that's going to be how much it's going to cost and it's going to be cheaper than the taxi meter. And the judgment, and I think this is a bizarre judgment personally, was that because the little gadget in the taxi gets its information from a server, the, the smart device does not count as a meter. I think that's a very perverse judgment because they should be thinking about the totality of the server. The gadget in your hand and the taxi's hand, the gadget in my hand as a user, and the server that Uber run or whatever. So we, I think it's, he should have been looking at the totality of the service, not the narrow focus of the technology in the gadget. So I'm going to assume that when it goes to the higher levels of courts, people are going to be challenging at the service level, not at the, the little device level. And that's what we really need to be thinking about as we do this module and do the other projects that Clive is exposing you to uh, in, IT, um, in the group project one, like last, yesterday afternoon. So let's see where this takes us. Go to week five and you'll find the seminar uh, at that point. So what we're going to be looking at, actually we're not going to look at that one because we'll look at business needs uh, next week when we've got the context of the enterprise architecture. So we'll start off with what was the vision? What is the vision for a service? What's the vision for uh, the, old, the actual systems that are going to support it and provide those services? And remember, the service, the system, is not just pure technology. It includes everything that delivers that service. All the people, yeah, the technology, the electronic stuff, the paper systems that fit around it perhaps, and so on. So first, looking at 
What do we mean by architectures? How do these things called architectures fit in to help us to understand what's going on and what's needed? And I introduced to you there the six questions that are really, really <coughs> fundamental. I think we touched on them last week slightly. The questions of who, how, what, where, when. Those are the questions which will help you to understand anything that's happening, anything you need to do in your private life, your professional life, your university. The six questions that we're going to come up with will help you in all of those situations. <clears throat> now let's have a look at a sort of a, you might say, a standard definition. Then we'll see where that takes us as we move forward. A design. And it talks here about the hardware and the software and the combination of the two. But architecture is about the broad outline. If you think to building, designing and build uh, a building um, for maybe a house or maybe something spectacular like the shard, uh, tower building when they built that, designed that a long time ago, or even you think about the Millennium Bridge. The architect, whether it's Lord Rogers or someone famous like that, or um, Zahidi, when she designed spectacular uh, buildings and stadia around the world, they create the vision, the overall shape the sort of thing that it's going to do to satisfy the business need, whether it's going to cross the uh, Thames, where the Millennium Bridge is, <coughs> or Zahidi's big stadia around the world. There's a sort of an overall high-level perspective the customer is thinking about. I need to do something. The architecture does that, the broad outline. But then the architects, these famous architects who lead great international um, practices, they then have huge teams of support, uh, you might almost call them technicians, who do the individual designs, whether it's for the steel work, the concrete work, the wiring, the plumbing, that's all done at a fine detail level. And we'll see how these fit together with the Zachman architecture. Zachman points out and uses as his framework this rather high-level concept, logical structure for classifying and organizing those elements of an enterprise or a building or any sort of um, human endeavor that are significant to both the management of the enterprise and the development <coughs> of it, in our terms, information system, in Zahidi and Rogers' concept, the physical systems that actually provide the individual service of wiring and water and waste disposal and so on, all the lifts. So it's a broad picture that sets out the overall vision at the highest level. And you can go to that website, and you will need to be going to that website to pick up all of the stuff you need to know. Why? Why do we need some sort of a framework, whether it's a Zachman Enterprise Architecture Framework or all of the other sorts of frameworks we've been uh, given? One is that most of the stuff we do is incredibly complex. Whether it's designing the shard or a big stadium, whether it's designing large systems, they are very, very complex. We also know that in the IT world, with the Standish Group uh, reports over the many, many years, we know that IT is a particularly fraught environment. We have very low levels of success. It provides a more rigorous, more logical, clearer way of thinking about the problem and doing something about it. And if you get the right framework, it provides a really good means of communication between all of the parties involved in this exercise. One of the biggest problems we have with IT is that most people don't understand our language. Just think about all the terms we use in information technology in our systems. How 
many people out there who aren't involved with IT much actually understand most of the terms we use? Very, very few. We have what's called a jargon, a closed language which we use for a variety of reasons. Partly, we use it because it's a quick way, a shortcut way of talking amongst ourselves about the systems, about the problems. And if you look at accounting or business, medicine, psychiatry, etc., etc., every one of these professions, every one of these knowledge areas have their own set jargon. Sometimes those jargons are created also because it forms a way of um, kind of pretending that we are better than everybody else. We can understand this language, and you guys out there, you can't understand it. And we don't want you to understand it, because if you can understand it, what's my value? That's kind of the conspiracy <laughs> theory approach, but if you actually look at the practicalities, mostly the jargons are created as a shortcut means of communication. But it then makes it incredibly difficult to talk to some of this other, organized, other group of people. And of course, when you're trying to design a new system, you've got the business jargon, which maybe the IT people don't understand too well, and you've got the IT jargon, which the business people most certainly don't understand for most of the time. And so what we're trying to do with frameworks and methodologies, and there's vast ranges of methodologies out there for systems design, is to try and provide a means of translating clearly and effectively between the different jargons. And one of the ways that you could become really successful in the field of information technology in the sort of area that you guys are being trained up in, to be on the analytics side and information technology, the broader use of IT, is that you need to be able to understand multiple jargons. You are not going to be the computer scientists who have got their own jargon, who are actually building the software and building the technology, but you need to understand their jargons. You need to understand the jargons of your business customers, the marketing jargon. <laughs> Uh, finance, accounting, engineering often. And if you're going to be successful in the analytics field, then you need to understand many, many jargons. Clive was talking last week and using Porter's Five Forces to help you understand the broader um, business perspective. I should mention that when I said we use Porter's Five Forces at Rolls-Royce, I was wrong, I'd forgotten that actually we use a different one of them. Porter's models, which is a value chain model. That was the one we used to cascade down when we were look decomposing tasks at Rolls-Royce. And so we got Porter with a couple of really valuable models, frameworks, which you can use to understand how businesses operate. Five forces are the external pressures, basically, on a company. The value chain is what's going on inside the organization. And these all help communication and you have to but this is you guys you are going to be the people who more than anyone in the world have to translate between multiple jargons otherwise you won't understand the request you're getting from your marketing or business or finance uh, customers who want you to analyze this vast amount of data and if you remember back last year with um, intro to data analysis you know, you were trying to find interesting data sources to look for the interesting questions that would be of use to somebody else. And you're going to need to do that more and more. And that's what we're going to be helping you with, with, helping you with over the next couple of years. To learn how to understand other people's perspectives through these frameworks which you're going to research and learn. <coughs> Ideally, the framework should recognize the business customer languages and requirements and the technical side in a way that you can really clearly see that you're covering all of the things that are necessary. That's what the frameworks are going to do for you. These ideas come directly from Zachman and his uh, particularly really good book that's out uh, in the library that we've got. We've got one or two copies, and I've got one up in the office. 
it starts at the top of the organization. The people with the broadest business perspective of what they're trying to achieve. And at the top level, senior management broadly have the perspective of driving a company in the right direction and ensuring that there's effective corporate governance. Things can be done and proven to be done in a lawful fashion, amongst other things. It thinks about the person at the bottom, the person who needs or is going to use that particular service and is being supported by them. We need to be able to understand all of the important requirements. Because it, it's incredibly expensive and time consuming to correct a system which has only got a partial design. We need to be able to understand everything about it so that we can work out the connections, the data requirements, the processing requirements, and all those other things. And as we, did, in terms of some of their responsibilities, one of those, in terms of the uh, United Kingdom's Companies Act 26, 2006, uh, in section 174 thereabouts, one of the fundamental responsibilities of company directors under English law is to think about and consider the survivability, the long-term survivability of their organization. Lots of others, there are about six other items there, but that's the primary concern for long-term business survivability. And those frameworks ought to help us to understand what's needed help them to understand what's needed in driving the company or the organization forward into the future. So, first exercise, folks, well, I'll go through the slides and then we'll come back to this one. I want to get so I can video it without lots of sections. And then, so there's going to be one, a task shortly, which is to look for uh, sources in the literature, in the internet, all about the Zachman Enterprise Architect. Find out what it says about them. Build your working bibliography with these sources that you're using there. I'll carry on, answer some of those questions, but I want you to do that research because you're going to need some of those references in the work you're going to do for your article, for your assignment. Zachman is basically a nice little pretty picture of a matrix, uh, 2D matrix. Um, <clears throat> across the page, we have the things that need to be done, the things that are actually done or operated upon within the organization. And then the vertical axis, starting from the first level, the very top, goes all the way down, level by level, to identify who owns things, what sort of perspective we're looking at, and helps us to really understand how everything fits together. You end up with about a 36 um, cell matrix. If we look at the vertical one, the first one, the two that we are interested in in this module, and partly what Clive was talking about yesterday, here are the top two levels, the scope and the business model. I'm not gonna go down here, I'm going to keep it up, the context and the planner, the guy who's running the organization, responsible for the organization, planning out what needs to be done. As we get down to the next level, we're looking at who owns that business process. Then we get down to the person designing the logical structure of the system. And remember, system means everything. The fourth level is the technology model, which is all to do with the physical implementation and the person who's building it. The person doing the detailed specification and the programmers, probably. And then the fifth level is actually, right at the bottom, the person who's writing the code, typically. These are where we get the very, very fine detailed drawings and plans and specifications. These are how the, the level at which you um, here you have your uh, requirement specification at a coding level. Fine level, fine detail level UML perhaps, 
and also the software line by line <coughs> as you write it in your software language. Now, the content. IT services management is based on levels one and two. Broadly speaking, IT product development is levels two and three. Database and the database module you're doing with Dave uh, Voorhees and others is really three, four, and five, right down to that bottom level instantiation of the tables in the databases and so on, right down to the lines of code, C SQL code and so on here. So IT services management, IT product design, databases. And in some respects, group project, you're covering the whole lot. You're putting the whole thing because you're going to be building some software as well to end up with a working little system for your clients that you're going to do this work for, this external client who's coming in and say, I want this or this or this to be done. But you, does that help you? Do you see now a little bit more clearly how the whole game works, how your different modules link together? So that's what we're trying, I'm trying to do with this, to show you how the whole lot works in the complete product life cycle. The twinkle in a director's eye that makes the world better for them, helps meet this sustainable development of the company, make it more um, successful and grow. You know, if you think about Uber, they had this idea up here, we can do better. And then the various teams working at these various levels who finally came up with, with their rather clever approach. So that's the perspectives, the way we're looking at things level by level. Now the other side, across the top, is, to me is really also very, very interesting. And if, with my background, with the SAP implementation and many other, other projects I've worked on while I was at Rolls-Royce, <coughs> had to cover a lot of these. <clears throat> and here you see those <coughs> six questions. The what, how, where, who, when, why. Or in a different, more business-like sort of context, data, function, network, people, time, and motivation. Because those, again, help you to understand why we need to do it, what we're doing, in terms of the data, particularly the functional description, the how do we process our data, the where. Where are we going to do it? Are we going to do it in the cloud? Are we going to do it on our own servers? Are we going to do it locally on our PCs or on our smart devices or on servers somewhere else? Who? All the stakeholders that you need to be thinking about, from the owner, the sponsor, the supporter, uh, the experts, customers, the suppliers, a lot, quite a wide range of who type of questions. Then there's when. When do we need the project for? When must we implement? Do we really need to be first to market? Do we really need to suffer at the bleeding edge of technology, the edge of technology where things are going to fail or might fail? Or can we just hold off for a little bit later and be a not one of the innovators, but a follower when other people have solved the problems for us. Other questions of why, when, you know, when do we need to run the sort of backups? When is it that people are going to be doing jobs? So if you are the people who run Turnitin, one of the biggest questions about when is when is the load on Turnitin going to peak? And anybody with a only a small amount of knowledge of how universities in the UK operate will realise that there are two or three weeks during the middle of December when there is going to be a stunning load hitting the services. All of you guys, all of your, all the students, all 600, no, it's more than that, yes, about nearly a million students in the UK are probably all submitting their assignments into Turnitin uh, those three weeks, the first two, three weeks of December. And that means we need to scale up our capabilities from pretty low level during most of the academic uh, semester. And those last two, three weeks, we need to ramp it up from nearly zero to astronomical. 
And then we can scale back down again quite quickly thereafter. So there's a when. I mean, it, when we're doing stuff with SAP, one of the things I discovered very early on monitoring the systems of, once we went live, that Monday morning between 9 o'clock and 9.30 was our peak load on the system. That defined, really, the power that we needed to have available to us. And then half an hour later, it dropped off by about 50% for the rest of the day, and by 5 o'clock, it dropped to nearly nothing. Tuesday morning, 9 to 9.30, a big peak, but less than the Monday morning one. Tuesday, Wednesday, a slightly lower peak, that half hour, and so on. And you could actually sort of see it rippling through the week. And so we needed to scale our system so that the first Monday of, the, of each month of the, the four-week cycle was the biggest peak of the lot. The second week Monday was a bit lower. The third week Monday was a bit lower. The fourth week Monday was even lower. So there's all sorts of when issues that you need to uh, think about. And then there's the final one, the motivation. Why are we doing this? And again, why is actually quite important because it helps us to understand, do we really need to do it or is it just a like? It'd be nice to do this and if it's not absolutely fundamental, maybe we don't prioritize it quite so early in the project. We might even just throw it away and say, out of scope. So six terribly important questions. <coughs> and this is Zachman's um, way of presenting it to us. There are various different versions of this picture from A4 to A, roughly up to A3. And the PDFs, you can actually blow up on your screen and actually read all of these quite neatly. And you're going to need to do some research around the Zachman architect, Enterprise Architecture to understand what each of these boxes, these 30 odd boxes, yeah, there's 30 boxes in the main part, and then finally you've got a really ultimate detail at the very bottom level, the sixth level. But we don't really go into um, what's down here very much. We're interested in this lot. And you'll see data, function, network, people, time, motivation, and the what, how, where, who, uh, when, and why. Our level for ITSM, IT product development, databases, and the whole lot for Clive. But remember when he, what he said yesterday. Don't get into these level questions too early. You really need to understand the context and scope of what you're doing up, the, up at that level first. So one of the other projects that's come out of the work that um, Clive has been doing to identify interesting projects is one that I'm going to be looking after, hopefully with a few others involved, which is the problem of lone workers. There are lots of organizations who send people out around the countryside each day to do various things. And they may well plan out where they're going tomorrow, record that in the office so the office knows where they should be, and then they will phone home, as you might say, every now and then to let them know that they're okay. They may have just a couple of points, you know, midday, and then perhaps four or five o'clock in, in the evening when they finished everything. And if something goes wrong during the day, at the moment it will only be at the maybe the midday or the end of day that someone back in the office says, oops, Rich has not checked and I wonder what's happened. Has something disastrous happened? Has it been an accident? Maybe on the roads? Has it been if they're sort of walking around or surveying the countryside, visiting uh, farmers and so on? And maybe just inspecting farms or rivers, if they're from the um, environment agency perhaps. Have they fallen into the river? Have they fall, fallen down a sort of bank and broken a leg and no one knows about it for six hours? And so the question is not the detailed question, okay, well, where might they be? But it's what are we trying to achieve? What is the big picture up here? So if you go back to yesterday, what? What sort of projects uh, were you being exposed to, folks? <clears throat> I saw that she was very vague on what she, exactly she wanted, but she, me and Oak sort of figured out it looked like it was some sort of database. 
she, um, she like, James, I really, really vague what she said. Yeah. But she had like certain concerns that I reckon we could apply the knowledge we've gained by the past two years to. Like, um, she really concerned about our social media uh, presence, which we're going to do next, which, yeah, um, next semester. Um, but a lot of it was data management because her company has just started growing, so she's having difficulties managing uh, IT with her growth. Yeah. So she's having some issues with the data, <coughs> which we could attach the database management to. So. Okay, so you're diving in down here. Where you need, and she may not, may still think of it all down here. What you have to do, although to get a sensible solution that meets the needs of her organisation, is to say, sorry, I'm not interested at the moment. I need to understand what is your business doing. <clears throat> what is the focus of your business? What is the high-level business problem that you are needing to address? Is it understanding? what the world out there thinks about you? Or is it you want to understand what the world out there, or what they want from you in terms of a, a communications or something like that? So you, you've got to get up to that level, folks. What is it she's trying to achieve and why? And this is one of the really, really clearly illustrates the problem with a lot of people who don't really understand IT. They just know that it's the magic silver bullet. And there's a guy called Professor Angel from London School of Economics said about ooh, 10, 12 years ago, most business people consider IT to be the magic pixie dust that you sprinkle gently over a problem and it magically disappears. And of course, we all know there's no magic pixie dust, there are no magic silver bullets. So what's necessary is to <coughs> quietly and carefully help business people to get out of the ditches, counting petals on the daisies, which is sort of down over here somewhere, and think, what is the real problem that needs to be solved? You can, I, I mean, it's easy to produce a database about anything. But is it going to be useful? Is it going to help them solve their problem? Or is it going to be one of those many, many, many uh, IT system developments, database developments in Access or whatever, or even in Excel, which don't actually address the real problem? And so when you understand the whole of this, then you can begin to really help the customer <coughs> or even higher level, the sponsor, who is the person with the pay, the money, the, the, so the sponsor is up at this sort of level, the customer is, that, is at that level, who's the person who actually is going to help specify it. But it needs to be in that really high level, broad context, that what the real problem is, and mostly the people who come to us and say, we need your help because you're the IT specialist, only know they've got a, a problem at a low level, mostly. And it takes a lot of effort, and particularly with small and medium-sized organizations, <laughs> they really don't understand how this sort of thing works. I mean, it, if you think about big organizations, whether here or Rolls-Royce, where I was, now, broadly, some of the execs do understand some of this level. They do understand they need to think about that corporate big perspective that needs some help, and then we also slowly work our way down here. Porter's five forces and Porter's value chain kind of start off at this sort of level. And when you cascade down lower and lower, you can use better perspectives as you break the task down. And that, but that part of the analysis, problem analysis um, game and part of the design process and implementation process. Now, the next set of slides really is kind of interesting. It comes from a book, uh, the book that's at the back of this. I can't remember what the name is at the moment, but it's by O'Rourke. And she takes us through many, many aspects of the Zappman Enterprise architecture square by square in that matrix. She tries to give us a variety of ideas that help us to understand 
what we mean by the planner's perspective. And she goes right back to the 2500 BC to show how these principles are enduring. They are relevant, or have been relevant now for the best part of four and a half thousand years. The other had an answer to the why. Why should we build this monstrous pyramid? Well, because the pharaoh was considered to be a god. It's part of their culture around that. The pharaoh, when he died, needs a tomb to be buried in. And they had the belief that they had a lifestyle in the afterlife. Hence, they needed somewhere to be able to store all of his uh, amazing possessions that, so that he could have something to live in a suitable style in the future. In terms of who, this was a gigantic project. 25,000 volunteers notice. Not just slaves, but volunteers. This, of course, gives some enormous personnel human resource management issues because you've got to provide, you've got to find people to build roads, you've got to find masons to cut and uh, stones to the right size, bear in mind they're big stones, not little ones, people to float the stones from where they were quarried all the way down the Nile, people to dig earth and so on. <coughs> And as part of the HR problem, all of these other questions about responsibility and authority. Where are you going to get them? How are you going to keep them? How are you going to pay, pay them? They built large villages for them to live in. Stunning logistics and project management question. They were able to handle, without Gantt charts, without critical path analysis, all the sort of things we take for granted today, they had to schedule in 2.4 million blocks, which are five foot by five foot by six foot, which is, that's about two and a half tons <coughs> or more. It might be even be four ton blocks. And they had to arrive in sequence at the right time. And then another example she uses a bit later on, which, which is in the slides, but I don't want to take, spend time going through them all. If you think about 2,000, two and a half thousand years later, when the Colosseum in Rome was built, they had to handle tens of thousands of carts, of horse-drawn carts or bullock-drawn carts, every day, coming from the various sources of rock and so on, into Rome and out of Rome without having a traffic jam. And they had to get the right blocks at the right time, otherwise they wouldn't be able to build it properly. So, an astonishing project this was. And they didn't even have our approach to numbers and so on. They didn't have an alphabet like we have, they had the hieroglyphic alphabet. A question where? And they didn't build it where it's sent easy right by the river. They built it across the floodplain, up the, the hill, onto the plain above there. Extraordinarily inconvenient because it was dry, there was no water up there, it was desert. So they had to transport everything from the river, food, water, and, and the stone, all the way across that floodplain, which is quite a few miles across from the Nile, up. They had to build ports, they had to build roads, they had to build ships just because they wanted to build it at Giza. <coughs> 2.4 million granite blocks, five by five by six. These are the cladding ones, the beautiful ones on the outside, which have now eroded somewhat. And then the special finishing blocks, the alabaster, 25,000 of those. Beautifully polished, plus untold millions, probably, of chisels, hammers, and so on and so forth. And like all projects, there's a time scale, there's resources and money. With the other threat part of the uh, quality triangle of perfect quality. You're building it for someone considered to be a god, so you can't have second best. <coughs> yeah, quality was absolutely a requirement. And yeah, they had all this.
this is how. How were they going to achieve it at that top level? Some stunning questions. Think back. 4,500 years when they had all of the processes and techniques in hand under, sort of, that they knew about that we are still doing 4,500 years later. They had to do it before the guy died. <clears throat> they had 25 years to cut those 2.5 million odd lumps of rock. They knew everything they could about that project at different levels of the management organization. They understood these things about logistics management, critical path, an path analysis, the sort of things that we thought we'd only invented in the 1950s and 1960s when NASA sent a man to the moon. They had it off to a T 4,500 years before that was done. Differently, but they had the concepts that they were working on. And they understood this concept, as I mentioned here, an event. The thing that is a little bar in a Gantt chart, or a little bar in a critical path analysis type of network. The thing that had to be completed, something had to be accomplished. They understood all of these things. And how? Because they've been doing this for probably 500 to 1,000 years. They knew all of the ways they had to, um, or things they had to put in place to build a pyramid. And remember that the first pyramids that they developed were very much trial and error. The first few pyramids, they got the angles wrong, and so they just slid into a heap. And in fact, there are still some near here, near Giza, where <coughs> you can see uh, the unsuccessful pyramids that they used, in a sense, learning. If you think back through into the Middle Ages in the UK and in Europe, <coughs> when the great cathedrals were being built, Interestingly, they took four times longer than this little beastie. Some of them took a hundred years to build. And what we see now as the success of the cathedral architect and builder's art and craft, the final finished cathedral, which has lasted for 500 or 500 odd years, they didn't always get those right either. And there are quite a few occasions where the original plans weren't quite right. They hadn't learned enough about the physics, the dynamics of building these stone buildings, and they got it wrong, and there was a big disaster, and things fell in. And then they learned from that and built the next version and were more successful. So all sorts of things help us to get the right people in the right place, doing the right things at the right time, for the right reasons, at the right cost. Now that's actually quite an interesting statement here. This comes again from O'Rourke's book. And that is actually pretty much the wording of good governance in simple form. Corporate governance, information governance, you can add a few more right something or others in a sequence until you've covered all of the things you need to worry about. But at the top level of the planner, this is what the Zachman architecture helps us to do. Now, we can go on. What I want you to do, though, rather than me taking you through the owner perspective and the next level down but, and so on as we go through, I want you to start thinking about this. Look at these slides as well and work your way through it. And also to get hold of those um, various web resources that will help you to understand rather more clearly the whole of the Zachman Enterprise Architecture approach. Some interesting sources. This is the one I was mentioning, O'Rourke, Fishman, Selkoff. Enterprise architecture using the Zachman framework. Yep, it's a 2003 book, but it's a really great read. It's about that thick, uh, but it's fantastic in the way that it tells you all about how to use this enterprise architecture approach, which is then turned into something useful and implementable 
with a TOGAF system, which is based around this architecture, but just turned into an open source, practical way of doing the job. So that's really the challenge for today, is to find out as much about Zachman and how it gives you those really top level perspectives and then down and down and down through the different levels. IT services management and product design uh, and group project, down the levels two and three, IT product, uh, IT product development, and then databases. It holds it all together for you folks. Okay.